Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds well we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one sam turner Sam studied ethology at the Agricultural University of Holland, where she received her Master's of Science degree in 1998. From there, she specialised in dog behaviour and training. In 2006, she founded her own dog training facility, Paws for Fun. Always wanting to continue learning and teaching, she is always in search for more information by attending conferences and seminars. In 2012, she developed pro proprioception training for dogs in the Netherlands. This has resulted in a puppy, adolescence, and senior program in the form of workshops and courses. Teaching is a passion for Sam, and in 2013, she started an instructor's course on pro proprioception training as well as an online learning environment, the Clicker Training Academy. The later is not active at the moment, but she does plan on providing more online learning moving forward. Sam gives lectures and workshops for professionals in the pet and sport dog industry on the subjects of clicker training, puppy development, adolescence and proprioception training in different countries. Scotland, England, Belgium, Denmark, Iceland, France, the Netherlands and Australia. In June 2016, Sam was a speaker at the Institute of Modern Dog Trainers, the IMDT, conference for trainers and behaviorists and she's just returned from the animal training symposium in perth australia where she was a speaker there in october 2017 sam's fourth of a series of books was published in the netherlands the series title is your dog physically and mentally in balance focusing on different developmental stages in dogs pup adolescents adults and seniors and the fourth book is about the dog as an athlete Additionally, Sam has written several articles on dog behavior and clicker training for the Dutch website doggo.netherlands and has published an article in the spring 2017 issue of the APDT quarterly magazine, The Chronicle of the Dog. There'll be more books to look forward to as well, as Sam has started writing about puppy and adolescent development, as well as proprioception training in English. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Sam to the show today. Sam, how are you? I am good, thanks, Ryan. And it's evening there for you and morning in New Zealand, so great, as always, to be sat on opposite sides of the planet and have (laughs) these conversations. I'm going to dive straight into the first question today, Sam. Could you please take everyone listening back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and share some stories of that time and some of the first animals you ever trained using it? Yeah, Uh, well... Actually, I learned about positive reinforcement training at uni. Uh, I was um, dog training already at that time, but it was quite traditional. And um, so it was very dominance-based and you're only telling the dogs what not to do, basically. And then I went to uni and found my passion, basically, which was ethology. And I specialized ethology and physiology. 
But learning about um, uh, learning, basically, at uni was fantastic. So we got classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and that got me into the positive reinforcement training. And shortly after that uh, introduction, I think I was almost finished uh, that the clicker training uh, with Karen Pryor came up. So Karen Pryor's book, uh, Don't Shoot the Dog, was out and... I was sort of looking at my training with my dog at the time and trying some stuff out, but Karen Pryor's book uh, really brought it home to get that click, like, right, because of what I've been learning at uni, you can actually use that (laughs) on your dog at home. And uh, so my first animal species I worked with was dogs. So my own Dalmatian that I, uh, yeah, as a crossover trainer, basically at that time was uh, going to teach him all sorts of cool stuff, I thought, using clicker training. And uh, it was fantastic. It was such a great way to communicate. But I also remember the, uh, <laughs> how do you say, the confusion because it was such a different way of communicating. And this spotty dog looking at me going like, yeah, you tell me what to do then. And I'll do it. Uh, whereas I was, you know, trying to uh, reinforce everything he was going to show me. And uh, so we had a, a, a yeah, a period of, of switching from one type of training to the other. Uh, but it felt so much better. So, yes, the confusion. But, uh, you know, after a little while, he um, yeah developed the confidence that everything was good basically what he was going to do and he finally understood really understood what I uh, what I was trying to uh, to teach him so that was the first animal species and um then I went and played around with the Shetland pony, which is fun. <laughs> the Labradors under the horses, I think, uh, which was cool because uh, I don't think he'd ever been really trained. Just, you know, they get a halter on and you, know, you, 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 you sort of steer them whichever way you want them to go. But it was fun because he really taught me that, it, uh, that I needed to look at species-specific behavior. So how do they actually eat? Uh, so how to present it and also the signals that um, that signal signal confusion or, or stress or um, the light bulb moments. So that was really interesting. Um, and <laughs> I've got a third species, humans. Uh, <laughs> so I actually tried. Uh, I was working as an office manager at the time and I was using positive reinforcement training for my colleagues, which... Uh, it was fun because the CEO sort of clicked onto it. Uh, he said, you're using clicker training, aren't you? Without the clicker, obviously, uh, because his wife was also a trainer. So he'd, uh, <laughs> he sort of learns about that in his house. So, uh, yeah, it worked fantastic. It was brilliant. Uh, and just positive reinforcement was so um, enlightening and it gave me so many possibilities of changing behavior, not in a malicious way, for even on using it on people, it was just to get the communication going. And uh, instead of nagging or continuing to ask in a way that people would stop wanting to do something for you or with you or out of habit would say no, uh, you'd open the communication and uh, have people offer behavior and, uh, yeah, reinforce that. It was brilliant. I really loved it. But, it, yeah, it was. it's not something you'd... T- you then tell people that I'm going to do this. <laughs> so <laughs> it was interesting. And I also got to know the importance of reinforcers. So, yeah, with the humans I was um, I was working with at the time, people I was working with at the time, uh, the reinforcement was really simple. It was mini Mars bars. And uh, it was brilliant. So there's no money. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it, it, it was great. It also, uh, that really taught me about being subtle. And taking really small steps, uh, and and move on from there. So that was cool. Yeah. So it was was the pun intended there that your boss clicked on to the fact? That uh, yeah, you- it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Getting the hang of this language. There's a few elements in your story that I think uh, others have shared. You you started off using different techniques to begin with. Uh, I find it interesting that you studied ethology, and I feel like we've had, including myself, numerous people on this podcast who start off studying ethology, 
uh, and then kind of get pulled more towards the applied behavior analysis or operant conditioning side of behavior. Uh, and you're influenced by Karen Pryor's book. Um, so all things that share similarities with other guests. So cool to hear that. And so I'm saying this stuff because there's people who listen to the podcast who are at a stage of their journey, which is the start of their journey. What advice might you have to people that are wanting to get into animal training based on your story and based on uh, what you've what you've seen with others? Ah, um, yeah, um, read. That's that's one of the things that I that I learnt. Um, um, so read about not just the positive reinforcement, but the operant conditioning. I think for me that was the eye opener because I was already in punishment based training. But if you put it, yeah, very crudely, uh, but that is one of the parts of the operant conditioning quadrant of course so getting to grips with the quadrant and one of the other things that um i would is don't get pinned down on one species because um even learning about other species behavior uh or body language uh mostly is really really informative it's going to really help you get to grips with the behavior of the species you're most interested in but it's it's really hard to um, get loose from one species if you're too focused on that species. So I would straight away, if you're starting on your journey, straight away jump into other species and talk to people who are working with um, uh, either zoo trainers because they're really, you know, they love talking to people. As far as I'm, I've, I've um, met them. They really love sharing s- stories and experiences and talk about the species they work with. But also horses and even I worked with goats as well. That was just for fun. But getting to learn different species, getting to to know different species is really good. Um, and going to conferences, seminars, and just soaking in information. Um, that for me was, I think, the fastest learning. That So with it, the, the reading, yes, and the doing courses, yes, but going to short seminars and conferences, so weekends or even days or even half a day, um, and immerse yourself <laughs> in in that material material that you're interested in that is really gonna help your learning and it also broadens your view a lot i find so you potentially just define what it means to be a behavior nerd yeah <laughs> no <laughs> so that <laughs> <laughs> start telling yourself you're a behavior nerd and, and create that persona yeah exactly yeah yeah but the, the fun thing is is that's why I say multiple species because it it really deepens your understanding of everything and um, and then take it a step further and just try and look at movement <laughs> because that's my that's my geekiness even gone further. So I, I started out looking at body language ethology and and learning about um, cause th- because I did agricultural uni, I uh, started looking at chickens and pigs and cows and and goats and sheep. So there were all these species that I did not have in the house. Uh, but it was really interesting because it did teach me so much about my dogs as well um, by looking at different movements or different areas of the body that you could get information from. And that really broadened my understanding. And that, that's really what blew my mind at a certain point. I thought, all right, I really can use that for everything. And I used it as an office manager. I worked as an office manager for a while. And um, I actually used my eyes to how measure up is not completely the right word but I think you'll sort of know what I mean to measure up the people that came for interviews and I could sort of tell by their uh, muscle tension and how they carried themselves and how they used their eyes uh, and how they had their weight distributed over their feet uh, I could sort of tell how that interview was going to go and I was I think eight out of ten times I could sort of give a summary of what I thought was going on in that room and the interviewer would say, yeah, that's right. So it was really, that was really cool. I thought that was so cool. And that was just me trying to project project uh, my um, view of how I look at animals onto, well, the human animals. Interesting. 
Yeah. You said there yeah, that it blew your mind and you used the word earlier uh, that moving over to clicker training was enlightening versus, yeah. versus nagging your animal, you said. Um, the other word you brought up numerous times there was communication and yeah. that's, that's what you're talking about there then with body language. So let's leave that yeah. topic on the, the – uh, well, that question, I should say, on the importance of communication and becoming a behaviour nerd. Does that sum it up? <laughs> Yeah, that does. Yeah, <laughs> I've <laughs> loads of words for just that. Yes, <laughs> that does. Um, yeah. And then before we move on, actually, just bring us up to speed. Where are we now? Your your main focus is running uh, your business. Yes, uh, my main focus is actually slightly changing. My main focus is moving to or towards training trainers, and it it is going you know the beyond geek thing. Um, it is because I'm so focused on uh, looking at bodies and body language, and I love teaching people with their pet dogs. But I found that. Because I like nerdy conversations as well, uh, I find that teaching trainers is uh, really stimulating for me. Uh, so my focus is, is actually on teaching trainers and teaching people who want to learn more about uh, training and more about their species um, and hopefully help them then teach people uh, to teach their pet whatever dog, cat, horse, doesn't really matter. And uh, so, yeah, Pause for Fun is my business. That's where I teach um, people with their pets. And um, then the new website that's going to be there is just going to be me because I want to, uh, yeah, Pause for Fun is really based in Holland and uh, I'm the one that does the traveling. Awesome. Sounds fun. Yeah, it is. <laughs> hey, wonderful. And I love hearing about people's what I call behavioral odysseys. So thank you very much for sharing, Sam. Moving forward, I'd really like to talk about proprioception. We've said that word a couple of times already in this podcast. So can we just start off by telling people listening, what is this? What is proprioception? Yeah. Uh, proprioception is, um, if you look at the definition in the dictionary, it is knowing where your body is in space in relation to everything around you. So um, knowing that if you extend your left arm, if you are or not or are not going to hit the wall that's right beside you and uh, the distance you have to a certain person. And the the best, um, I think the <laughs> the best uh, visual is you're sitting in your car, you're going to drive into a parking garage and you've got a van, it's quite high and you think, oh, is it going to fit? And you duck. And that's sort of where if you had really good proprioception skills, you would add this car to your uh, height and you wouldn't duck because you know, well, I don't have to duck because it's not going to hit my head. Uh, so that's that's the visual that uh, for me is a really, really good one. And it's um, if you then put it into dog training, it is teaching the dogs about knowing where they are because some dogs like humans um, are a bit less um, capable of uh, getting their bodies to exactly that spot where they want to be or breaking in time or turning in time before running into something. So it's it's all about uh, body awareness, knowing where you are. So knowing, knowing where your body is in space in relation yeah. to everything around you. Exactly, yeah. Um, and you said some dogs have a challenging time with this. What is it? Is it natural for dogs? Do you think what makes a dog more capable or less capable of knowing its proprioception? I, mm, I don't think it's a, it's a, um, um, it's an individual thing. It's it's the same with with people. Some people are much better at um, using their bodies than others are. So it's on one hand, it's practicing. So. Uh, individuals that have a lot of practice using their bodies and that find challenges interesting to do and um, just try, they will have a better proprioception skills. And the individuals that, that are a little more insecure uh, are less likely to just go for it and try. And they will usually have proprioception skills that are slightly lacking. Uh, not lacking, uh, it's not a really bad thing, but you can work on them to make them better. Um, but we, everybody learns about proprioception. Without proprioception, you can't 
walk around basically because then you would be crashing into everything so everybody's got some form of proprioception skills except some have it slightly finer tuned than others and it sometimes also has to do with um body type so the uh, more um yeah muscular or or a bit bigger uh types like bernese mountain dogs for instance or saint bernards they move with uh, bigger movements and they often have a little bit of difficulty being really precise with their bodies uh, because the movements are so big because the muscles are strong as well um, they sort of overshoot some things but also the uh, some of the bigger dogs will find it hard to try certain challenges because they're not quite sure if they're going to fit because they grew so fast uh, just before adolescence that they lost the plot um, which is always interesting to see. Can I just jump to that? <laughs> um, is that um, in development of the body, and it, it doesn't matter what species you are, but just before adolescence hit, just before uh, at the beginning of the hormone peaks, uh, the body has a sort of growth spurt. And that means in some dogs, they can add a couple of centimeters of length in the legs in just about a month's time. And that means that they don't have much time to get used to that difference in height. And uh, the muscles are not yet building up um, as fast as the length of the bone is growing. And they sort of lose their steering. It's a bit of a weird a way to put it I think but it's uh, where they lose their feet um, and I people that have had adolescent dogs from puppy onward will um, possibly recognize that week or two weeks that the dog they jump into the car perfectly or they get onto this uh, plank to walk into the car perfectly and all of a sudden they can't do it anymore uh, and that has to do with the change in how they can steer their body. So the, the change in proprioception uh, and awareness of the body because of their growth spurt, they, they just lose it. Now, with the bigger dogs, they lose it more than the smaller dogs because the smaller dogs don't have that much growing to do. So they don't increase their uh, height as much as the bigger dogs do. So if you look at a, a St. Bernard, a Great Dane, a Greyhound, um, they a lot of the time, or, or even a German Shepherd, they a lot of the time will completely lose their proprioception skills in adolescence, which is, I find, extremely interesting because you can work on that. But what happens is that um, we spend a lot of time working with puppies uh, and we do all sorts of challenges and we take them to, uh, or at least in Holland, we take them to the market, we take them to um, uh, to a cafe, uh, you know, we take them uh, when we go out to coffee with uh, at somebody's house. Um, and all of a sudden uh, they change because they've They've lost control of their body, it seems. And some dogs, if they're a little bit insecure already, will not want to try anything anymore because they'll just go, like, oh, crap, I don't know how to do that. And they'll get stuck. So they get stuck halfway the stairs or get stuck in the car or, you know, anything can happen, which, which makes it really interesting. But that um, – so the proprioception uh, body type has a really big – um, influence on it, how much you undertake with your dog has a really big influence on how proprioception uh, develops and um, basically the um, fitness or if they have any injuries as well. Because if, if, you, if you're going to have to be in your crate because you've broken a leg or if you've uh, got any other uh, physical disability when you're young, you're also not going to be able to practice with your body and not develop proper proper proprioception skills that is really weird to say that yeah <laughs> all right cool so we're gonna talk about all of these things a little bit more mm -hmm. um, but first let's help guide people's uh, understanding who are listening how are you taking all of this and and applying it to training and 
what kind of stuff are we teaching people in the workshops you do? Yeah. Um, so what I what do we do is uh, because it's about teaching the dogs about their body um, and compare it to gym class with with kids basically. Uh, you, you set you know you play games and you do all sorts of challenges and have them move their bodies. That's what we do with the dogs as well. So we we give them challenges that have got to do with placing your feet on something and then we make the distinction front feet, back feet. Uh, it has to do with changing your distribution of the weight. So that would be little um, uh, wobbly objects. So they can uh, move forward and it wobbles one way and they can move the weight backwards and it wobbles the other way. So that, that would be weight distribution balance. Um, we also work, uh, I offer a lot of um, Plank work, and that would be working on surfaces that are slightly off the ground. So you give them um, a, a platform to work on, uh, but you also make it slightly smaller than, than what they would have on the ground. So they have to work on where do I put my feet and still remain on it. Be aware that these this is wider than the dogs are. So if the shoulder breadth is like 20 centimeters wide, the planks would be about 40 centimeters wide. So they have plenty of space. Um, so that would be uh, working on balance and on uh, moving. Uh, what is also really, really interesting and really good for proprioception skills is um, learning how to deal with that human really close to you because that unsettles your balance. I don't know if you've ever noticed that if, if you're walking along with somebody and they sort of come a little bit closer to you, you go off balance a little bit. They sort of seem to push you out of the way. And um, we do that to our dogs a lot. So we have exercises that have them working together so they actually get used to where their own body is and where the, where, uh, the other, per other individual's body is. And that way learn how to control their weight distribution and balance in relation to somebody else. Really good proprioception skill that is. And we work on coordinating feet when there's objects in the way. So that could be uh, poles on the ground and it could also be a really low step to step onto and then step off so there's all sorts of different things that we do that have everything to do with balance placing your feet and learning to um, shift your weight from either left to right or front to back or even turn around and that they that way they learn uh, all the different elements of moving that body with knowing what they're doing not just not just that it happens to them, but they actually know how to do that movement so they can do it um, with more precision. And so it, it would seem logical that if our canine friends and ourselves, and especially mm -hmm. any animal you're working with, has improved proprioception, this is mm -hmm. just going to help them be more confident. Absolutely, yeah. It is, uh, I don't know how you were with... Um, Gym class or sports at school? Let's not talk about that. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm, I'm joking. right there. <laughs> but I was there. <laughs> and um, if you think back, if you look at any type of sports in schools, um, like uh, people get to pick who they're on the team with and, you know, you get a rope climbing challenge and some of the people that are not that good with their body sort of go off to one end and <laughs> try to do it the, the most easy way so they can have a ladder there or a chair there and, and that helps them up. And with dogs, it's, it's the same. So the more they know how to use their bodies and the more confident they are with their bodies, uh, the better able they will be to uh, face challenges in the world. And with challenges, that can be physical challenges, but it can also be mental challenges. Because if you already know how to handle your body, that also means you're going to be really good at using that body in communication because you actually have control of all those muscles. So you can make your communication larger or smaller or more subtle. And that way, um, make it easier to communicate what you want and also make it easier to pick up on what, what the other 
individual wants that's there with you. Um, but more, most importantly, if something happens, so even if you get a fright, it doesn't mean that you jump back and then you lose your balance as well. You just jump back and then land on your feet and think, oh, okay, I can handle this. And then you can move forward again. But if you then tripped up uh, because you didn't know how to stop that moving body that was jumping backwards, uh, that would make it even more scary. Uh, because you haven't got the control of your body that you would like, uh, which makes you more insecure. So it, yeah, it, it really helps uh, if you can, um, if you know you can do something. It just gives you that confidence, and it makes it much easier to do new challenges as well. And so, is coordination a similar word, or is that? Got- yep. Yeah. I think because I was talking to that, talking to other trainers in Perth and, and proprioception is a really, it's a bit of a difficult word. Um, and it not necessarily covers the whole of what we do. So in Holland, I actually call it balance and coordination training, which is more in the way of what it is. It's still not everything but it does perhaps and maybe maybe listeners can can comment on that uh maybe it does make it clearer uh on what the what the essence really is about of of this type of training and as you're talking to me it's making more and more sense why you might prioritize this type of training Mm -hmm. the result of a potentially more confident animal is going to make other behaviors and other areas you're training behaviors for, maybe easier for the dog, more fun, and you might get consequently more success. With that being said, what has your experience been with regards to the type of people that are wanting to learn this information? Is it pet dog owners? Is it just dog dog behavior nerd owners? Uh, Is it (laughs) sport dog people, people with dogs that need that because they've got health issues, bit of both or... What kind of people come but, in? Uh, all of the above. Uh, the thing is, I started offering the training for dogs that had a sporting career ahead of them, mainly. Uh, but really quickly, so within the space of two months, I thought oh, this is just this is just too good not to use for all the dogs, and and it 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 totally changed my whole training so the whole my whole training school changed in the setup of what we were doing and also um on you know how people have this sort of time set time of when they want the dog to be ready for something so um it changed for me into using proprioception or balance of coordination training to sort of extend the time in which the dogs get to develop their minds and their bodies. Uh, So for sporting dogs, it's a great start to, you know, being in control of your body so you can actually do the turns, uh, accelerate, break, uh, and and compensate for any mistakes your human handler makes, which mine is really good at because he's really good using his body. Um, and the other one is for pet dogs, it is really interesting for them to do something different than just walking or running after a ball. Because if you really look at the average, and I'm not, no offense to anybody, but if you look at the average life of the average pet dog, uh, playtime is usually a ball. Um, and then we have the walks, uh, but we can make that much more interesting if we make them more aware of their bodies and if we make the, the people more aware of their dog's bodies, because we can add little challenges. Uh, we can um, change walks into interactive uh, walks where they get get uh, challenged, but where they can also develop their muscle tone, their flexibility, their balance, the coordination. Uh, so for me, for pet dogs, it was important to add for uh, partly enrichment, and the other part is the self awareness, the self confidence, and and the trust they build. Because what you what I um, well what my learners notice and um, we had a great example f- with that in Perth again because we had only trainers we had only geeks there in my course uh, at that time and uh, the funny thing was that whilst I was coaching them on a certain exercise with the dog um, 
we could see the, the humans changing their proprioception skills. So they were being more aware of what they were doing, not flapping about their arms anymore and being calm and clear in their communication and having their balance in order. Uh, and as soon as that happened, we saw that the dogs picked up on that communication and changed their whole body language. So they went soft, they went calm, but also they their confidence grew because they were able to to do that little bit more which they weren't offering before uh their trust grew the communication and the the connection instantly changed which um again for me really emphasizes the importance of this type of training or this type of activity uh for any type of dog so be it pet dog or sport dog uh if you're a geek or just you know a pet owner who loves his dog it has such um an array of effects that really enhances your uh, your living together um and has all this added benefit of actually being really really good for the body so it, it in- increases fitness and increases health basically so you can set the environment up the antecedents up for your dog to succeed by being more coordinated yourself. Uh, absolutely. It is unbelievable how we get in the way of our dogs. But even if you just, again, walk along the street with somebody who's, if you walk along the street beside me, you're going to get bumped a lot because, you know, my, my personal proprioception skills without a dog are not that good. And uh, But you then get in the way of the other individual, which sort of, you know, messes up your communication. And you go like, ask, oh, can we just sit down and go and have a coffee? because it's just tiring to walk with you and um, you can imagine that that is something what our dogs will have as well it, it is so um, interesting to see the change in how the dog looks at their handler when they actually know what they are doing with their bodies and it's not easy that that I'll tell you straight away it's not easy but it's it is a brilliant way of changing your communication with your dog yeah, I, le- I learned that the other day. I did a Facebook Live training session with Phoebe, my dog, and I set the camera up on this like cheap tripod thing I brought from Amazon. It was attached to a, a shelf in my a training space, and to to get into the camera space to go Facebook Live, I had to kind of crouch, and it was sore on my knees, yeah. and, um, <laughs> and you know, I was kind of like conscious of being live on Facebook, and conscious of training, and conscious of being self aware, and then people will go, oh, look, Phoebe's uncomfortable because you're uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, yeah. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. This is something I didn't think about before I went live. I just yeah. like, I was focusing on other things, but it's a great example to um, put myself That's in a situation a, where I was yeah. quite uncomfortable. Um, really good example. And that, that again, then changes everything. Yeah. Mm. Um, so we got, you said the uh, – phrase that I think we might make the name of this podcast episode in there. You said it's too good not to use for all the dogs. Yeah, (laughs) true. Uh, Yes. So for people listening to this podcast who have their own individual situations, as we all do, obviously, Mm -hmm. and currently in their mind, they've got all of these behavioral goals outlaid in front of them, Mm -hmm. and they've got specific areas that they want to... Uh, learn more about and train more and then they listen to this podcast where where do we suggest that they inject this into their training with regards to prioritization of everything they're already doing yeah uh, depending on age uh, it can be really uh, um, it is really simple with every age you can start the same uh, and the, the thing I always start with uh, is different surfaces So surfaces that have a different feel and surfaces that can be slippery, surfaces that can be uh, rough and they can be fluffy uh, uh, or that can be a bit, you know, the the fake grass uh, doormats, that type of stuff. Um, So different surfaces because it has to do with changing the way you place your feet. Uh, So if you walk barefoot along different, um, over different surfaces, you will place your feet differently according to the surface. The same happens with dogs. So that makes them aware of even placing their feet. So that's a really cool one to start with puppies, definitely. But it's also a good one to do with senior dogs because the senior dogs will um, 
uh, be losing a little bit of proprioception because a lot of things change in their bodies uh, because the muscle tension decreases, which means the mechanoreceptors work differently, which means the joints are less stable, which means they walk differently. So changing the surfaces will actually activate that again and have them be more aware of their feet. Um, so that is one of the things that I would start with. And teaching, um, and I think a lot of people do that if they're already into this, uh, and some people maybe not yet, but teaching dogs to step up onto surfaces that's a little bit above ground height, a little bit of ground level. So they have to really step up onto something with their front feet, but also with the back feet. So teach them that back doesn't always follow front uh, so that they can be at different angles. So they can have their front feet up raised slightly and they can have their back feet up raised slightly. Um, and by having the front feet and back feet at different levels, they will have to learn about weight shift. So where do I leave my weight? Do I distribute it more to the front, more to the back? How do I change that? So that's a really cool and easy exercise. Um, with Can I do a little disclaimer in there? Uh, the, the, height, the height of the uh, little... Um, thing that you get to step onto and it can be anything it can be a box it can be a, 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 a tree stump it can be anything that you'd have handy but try to have the height of that surface um, a maximum of halfway between the ground the flooring and their elbow of the front leg and that way, even if your dog might have a problem with their back or their hips, which is a big, uh, that makes it quite difficult and hard for the dogs to do. If you stick below half of that length of that front leg, then um, the pressure won't be that much that it will be very uncomfortable. However, if they do not want to do it, it is not perhaps not your training issue, but it can be a physical issue. So that is something that we really watch with uh, proprioception that they, they can be uncomfortable. Um, so feet up, uh, front or back feet. And uh, a nice one, um, if you've got trees lying around <laughs> that have been cut down, <laughs> maybe, or if you've got low walls in your garden or in a park, try and teach your dogs to walk along them. Uh, that way they've got to match their body size to a smaller object again. So they have to remain in balance and uh, climb onto something and climb off something. So that is a really cool one to do. And with these exercises, you it's really simple, but it's enrichment. You're getting them to do something else. And it also teaches both you and your dog about their bodies. So what is their normal way of movement and how do they change that movement if you've been doing it for a couple of weeks? It doesn't have to be every walk, but it can be every other day that you do some of this stuff. And um, again, use different surfaces and uh, it, it'll, it'll just give you both the chance to uh, learn. But it, the added benefit is balance, flexibility, uh, and coordination of uh, of the feet, and I'd written something else down. I'm just going to look that. Um, oh yes, and the other one which I hadn't wasn't supposed to forget, and I've written it down just in case. It is uh, trying to go underneath something. So uh, it can be a, a, a pole, it can be a gate, uh, as long as it's not too low, and then uh, sort of crawl underneath. Not every dog does it naturally. The bigger dogs will have more of a challenge there than the smaller dogs. Um, but it's a really good exercise to learn about how big am I actually, and can I, can I do this or not? Now, if you've got an escape artist, don't teach them this. Because you you might not want to you might not want to do that if your gate's not completely to the ground anyway. So, but it, it's a really cool exercise to learn. So those would be the basics. Everybody can do this anyway. You don't need to buy stuff for this. This is this you can do with stuff lying around. And so this stuff you can just utilize what's in your environment and what's lying around your house. If people are wanting to get a bit more serious about this, and yeah they are looking to buy some equipment that might help them on this journey. What yeah. kind of stuff are we looking at here? What what proprioception tools are there? Yeah. 
Um, cavalettis are really useful. So that will be cones and poles that you sort of stick in between the cones. Uh, and the other material that you use is just you know, simple stools or, or uh, you know, um, that they can put their feet onto. And another great resource that I use a lot are steps, as in, you know, the aerobic steps. And depending on how large your dog is, um, it, yeah, it needs to sort of your dog needs to fit on it properly. So you can't use stuff that's too small. And um, I'd, I, the, the balance cushions, I think they're called. So they're these wobbly, uh, wobbly cushions um, that you can put for, for humans. They are for sitting on or for put, placing you to stand on. And those are really good resources to use with dogs as well, as far as wobbly, wobbly surfaces go. And you can buy that stuff relatively cheaply, can't you? From yeah. Amazon or eBay Yeah, or Amazon, Kmart. definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, but, um, for some of the stuff, it is really worth checking into the material because the, especially the balance cushions can be really cheap, but, the cheaper ones are mainly plastic and you want quite a, quite a good deal of rubber in there because that actually lasts longer and is not as slippery because you do want it to be uh, safe for the dogs as well, uh, which means if it's too plasticky, if it's very shiny, it's going to be very slippery as well, uh, which is not good because then you're restricted in when you can use it. And it can be more scary if the dog's not used to it, if it's slippery as well. And then they're less likely to be working out of relaxation instead of, um, you know, tensing up because it's that added added worry of slipping as well and so before people go out and buy all of this stuff at the same time even though we've just gone through a bunch of cool things you can buy i like buying mm. things yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, I like does. Just like stuff you don't my... you don't want to to, yeah i'll send you a photo of my of all the stuff i've got <laughs> it's quite amazing <laughs> yeah i don't want to get the like uh i don't want to look at my accounts every year and realize how much stuff i've bought yeah exactly. <laughs> all in the name of training though it's all it's oh, all in course. the name of training of yeah. course but you you, you said to me before we recorded that you wanted to uh, highlight that it's important to just start with the simple stuff really yes it is um uh, I, I think with everything that we do uh, uh humans as a species um like to increase our um levels of intensity with all sorts of stuff even look at our comp competitive nature uh and the bigger the better that's that sort of thing and what i really think is important in proprioception training if you are going to go into that into it give your dog time to get used to this sort of stuff it, looking at age not even not even looking at age is really important if especially if you look at age uh, for puppies, for instance, it's important to learn about coordination and balance, but their bodies aren't made for increasing muscle strength yet. They are meant to grow, but they are not meant to do any strength training yet. Uh, that doesn't come to, you know, well into adolescence because of hormones play a role in developing muscle mass. Um, so there, uh, with puppies, we tend to sort of um, go crazy. Oh, he can do this. So now we can do it, go on to that. And now we can do that. And then we see little puppies standing on balance cushions with four feet, whereas their bodies are actually really, really not, they can do it, but it's not meant to be done in that developmental stage. And the other thing that's important is, um, <laughs> Their muscles need to get used to the movement and muscle memory takes about six to eight weeks to develop. Um, so changing stuff up, you know, oh, he can do it. He's done it once. So I can increase criteria like we would do with clinical training if we were teaching a retrieve. Um, you want to wait for a little bit longer. You want to give the body time to practice and to develop the movement and to uh, give the muscles time to develop as well. Uh, and uh, tendons develop even slower because they don't get as much uh, nutrients in uh, as muscles do at the same time because they need, they need about two months' time to develop their strength. Uh, compared to it's only a couple of weeks with uh, with muscles. So uh, taking it slowly for the body is really important. 
and uh, trying to let go of it's got to increase every time. Sometimes just repeating things will give us uh, a good feeling. Uh, so being right is really nice and repeating uh, exercises, repeating uh, behaviors is really, really important because that will actually make it settle and that will make it uh, physically and mentally uh, stronger uh, in yeah for your dog. Hey, this is such great information and I know there's loads of people who are going to be listening to the show that this is going to be highly beneficial for. Hey, thank you so much for sharing all of that, Sam. You're welcome. The next thing you and I wanted to talk about was the importance of choice in your training. And I love that you wanted to talk about this. This is something we talk about a lot on this podcast. So I thought we'd do things a little bit differently this time and break it down. Sam, could you please tell everyone listening the top three reasons you think we need to incorporate choice into all areas of our behavior management? Yeah, the top three reasons for me are confidence, increased confidence. And um, the other one is trust, which is the interaction between the individuals, of course, and cooperation, uh, which sounds really weird. Because if you give, uh, some people think if you give your dog choice, then he won't cooperate with you. But for me, um, giving choice means that um, my learners will really cooperate with me. Once they learn, they are being heard. And that uh, is really powerful. And I must really stress that the importance of choice, I already sort of sort of knew with clicker training, but it really brought it home to me doing proprioception stuff. Um, because the number of ways that my learners were telling me no um, were were unbelievable and I'd, I'd missed so many uh, communication uh, moments uh, by being focused on what I was asking them to do instead of being focused on my learner and um, yeah that really so doing the proprioception training brought it home to me that choice will give my learner the confidence because I am listening so they will be sure that they will be heard uh, and that is just brilliant to see. It increased the trust in me. So once they knew they were being heard, they would trust me when I asked them to do something that they had not done before. And uh, their cooperation, that they were much more willing to cooper cooperate with me. Doesn't really matter what I was asking because they knew they could always opt out. They could always tell me that their choice was no. And um, it, yeah, that for me has been uh, really, I don't know, it, it's just given me so much uh, more out of my work with the animals than I ever thought possible, basically, because it's, you know, it's real clear communication. And seeing that an individual realizes they're being heard really heard is yeah it's it's again mind-blowing it, it's amazing what it does and also what it does in really short periods of time that they will show you that as long as they know they can say no uh, in the beginning then they will increase their no because they just want to be sure that you're hearing them no I don't want to do that and then Given them, give them time and offer them the challenges again, and then they will cooperate with you because they know they can opt out, and that means they are willing to try because it's always on their terms, and that's just brilliant. And so, two-part question uh, for those listening: How can they take away value from what you just said and incorporate into what they're already doing in their training? to give their animals more choice. And how do you incorporate that into your training of either dog trainers or people who are oh, going to be teaching yeah. dog trainers? What what, mm. what do you teach? Um, the way I use it, I think, is uh, – and that, that that is something that – that is everybody needs to develop that if if you're into behavior already you will be looking and the thing is to be looking at the right stuff so 
try and put the social uh, 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 thing out, uh, try and put it up, uh, switch it off for a little bit, and then just look at which behaviors is your d- the dog showing. So which movements are you seeing? What eye movements? What ear movements? What is the weight shift? And for me, the, the weight shift and the eye contact moments um, – were the ones that I was that I now focus on because uh, they were telling me the most of what was going on in the dog's body and um, I think being um, if you're doing training already or if you're going to start to do it and you want to incorporate more choice is to be aware of where is your learners doesn't matter what animal it is where is their weight are they coming forward or are they going backwards or sideways um and that that's not always instant to see but that is something that uh if you want to incorporate that in your training even if it's just on video looking back on what you were doing uh it will give you a lot of information on what's going on and that really helped me so it did take time uh as everybody i i had to learn uh and practice and yeah hit my head a couple of times <laughs> uh but uh that really helped me so weight shift weight distribution for me was really important and i think that is something that we tend to see when it's really big and we tend to miss when it's subtle so if it's just leaning not even leaning backwards but having your weight on your back feet more than on your front feet that is already information Uh, and that that changed everything for me seeing the weight distribution a part of it so so that would be for me something to start focusing on if you if you're going to get into it and if you're working with people or with dogs or with horses it doesn't matter we all do the same thing people standing on the heels uh having their shoulders slightly behind the hips they are telling you no even if it's not conscious but they their body is telling you no uh, which is really interesting because then if you then sell, take a step back yourself and, you know, or, or go and do that uh, and giving them that choice, even if you're handing them a couple of choices, then you will actually see what's going on in their, uh, in their heads. And that, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's something you could incorporate. That's what I started to incorporate. And I think that is something that is helpful if you're aware of it. Does that so make sense? Is it, is it a way to sum it up developing hypersensitivity to this stuff and doing that through observation yeah yeah i don't know if i don't even know if it's hypersensitivity or just training your eyes to see something that you weren't watching before seeing with new eyes uh, i think kate malatrat told me that one time they, they, they sort of that was the phrase that keeps sticking in my mind that that that's been with me on my proprioception journey it's seeing with new eyes so not looking at behavior in a social context per se, as in, you know, what everybody's learned about dog behavior, uh, but looking at it just just really dry stuff. Where is the weight? Where are his toes pointing? Uh, where is the balance going? Uh, is he leaning left? Is he leaning right? So it's as dry as that. And then the conclusions come afterwards. But because we tend to get stuck in behavior, as in this is uh, fearful and this is um, self-confident, uh, we tend to miss the subtle things because we keep translating. Uh, and that, that means sometimes we don't see the, the really basic stuff. Hmm, I think that's awesome. All right. So it's, it's a thickening of your behavioral glasses. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Time to see more slowly, which is difficult because the dogs are fast. Which means that another takeaway some people might be getting from this, and I am as I'm sitting here listening to you, is just another reference point to the benefit of filming your training because then you actually can slow it down. Exactly, yeah. And and even if you don't, I mean, I, I got it wrong. God knows. I used a training video of, of me and my uh, border when he was a puppy as a don't do this. Uh, because it, it just really, watching my own videos really brought it home to me that there are so many signals that I was missing that was so obvious. But because I was focused on the outcome, I did not listen to what my dog was telling me. And not because I was f- wanting to force, but just because I didn't see it for what it was. And that that's just, yeah, and that changed. And that uh, really made it um, more pleasurable 
Oh, now, I mean, for me, it was already pleasurable. And I thought the dog was having a lot of fun anyway. But it, now you can really see the difference, the, the relaxation that comes into the body when they know that they're going to be heard anyway. And they can just be subtle about it. They don't have to scream at you. They can just trust in the fact that you will be able to see their subtle movements. And dogs with each other are really good at subtle movements. And any animal is really good with subtle movements, but we are not good at seeing it. And we as a human species, we, we are pretty thick sometimes <laughs> when, it, when it comes to seeing signals. And uh, I think it is because we are so goal-oriented, as a, I think as a species even, but that's may, maybe because we're programmed that way from a young age. Or more than likely, it is that, and and that goal orientation is what what blinds us to all the other stuff. Very valid and valuable points there. Um, so I think you might benefit from listening to this part of the podcast a couple of times. Top three takeaways and your reasons for including choice in training is confidence, trust, and cooperation. Yeah, very cool. Hey, thank you for all of us, Sam. Sadly, we're nearly at the end. But that's okay, because we're also heading into one of my favorite parts of the podcast show, and this is story time. Uh, Sam, can you please share with everyone listening two or three stories from your experience training and working with dogs and animals so far, and some of the important lessons that these have taught you along the way? Yeah, um, I have a couple, and it's one of the ones is really proprioception oriented, and that is that we can... Uh, see that some animals le uh, have forgotten how to move in a certain way because they haven't had the opportunity. And by providing them with that possibility, again, with the opportunity of moving in a certain way, we can change their mode of movement totally and free up their bodies. So I had this, this poodle. Uh, I think it was – the. Um, yeah, I, I mean, he must have been about three or already four. And he was helping his handler as a signal dog. Uh, she had uh, seizures. She would seizure. And uh, he was mostly on leash when he was working with her. But then he would be off lead as well. So she came to training and we're doing all sorts of fun stuff. And I thought, oh, this is for such a small dog. He's moving in a way that I wouldn't expect. So I asked her, you know, does he always to have that way of movement? Does he always pace? He said, yeah, she does. he always paces. I said, does he always pace even if he's off lead? Yeah, yeah, he does that. So I said, well, can we just try something? So I added Cavaletti to his training and we did one session. And for me, this was such a, a you know, confirmation of what, what I was doing. Uh, and after that, he was able to trot again when he was off lead. He never paced unless he was on lead. And when he was off lead, he instantly knew how to trot again. So his whole way of movement had changed just because we'd given him the opportunity to feel what it was like. So um, for me, it was a realization of what we can achieve by offering something that is a natural thing for the dog to do, but they can actually forget if they can't practice it. So the use it or lose it principle, basically, which for me was really, really cool. Maybe it's too geeky, I don't know. But for me, that was that was one of my, my top learning moments that uh, the use it or lose it is really important, uh, even with dogs, even just with movement. So that was, that was really interesting. Um, a second story is um i think I've, I've, I've in the part in the the last one i we sort of touched on it already it is the communication or the disturbance in communication that we can have on our dogs and uh, it is not just a story of one dog this is a story of almost every dog that comes into this workshop or this class and it is plank work it is teaching um, a game to dog and handler, which is about dogs on the planks, handlers are on the ground, but they have to learn the game of staying together and moving together, basically dancing together without the music and without the hats and tap dancing or whatever, but dancing together and um, moving as one. And the beautiful part of this is that in the beginning, it's always awkward. It, it You know, it's your first dancing lesson 
and you step on toes and you forget the you forget to count to the beat and that sort of stuff and then when you get to the third dance even in just this first session when you get to the third dance suddenly you find the rhythm and suddenly you find the flow and everything clicks and the most important thing there for me is always that as soon as we as humans learn to be aware and be in the moment and actually be in our own bodies and not somewhere in our heads uh, flying off to this is the goal I want to reach, Um, then all of a sudden we have this open communication channel and the dance is just natural. And um, that for me is it's so amazing to have um, just changing how we are and how we feel in our bodies changes the whole communication with the individual we're working with and I can tell you that story with horses as well as soon as we know what we are doing as soon as we are present and um, not getting in the way then our learner will will dance with us basically so that 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 is uh, uh, the story that keeps repeating itself but never gets old (laughs) so that is I just love that Um, and my third story would be um, I think the lesson I've learned is the flexibility of minds and it doesn't matter whose mind it is. It can be the dogs, it can be the handlers. And this is the, uh, a senior dog, 12 years old, traditionally trained and comes for fun classes, but has never, ever, ever had the experience of, of, uh, being able to initiate something. So they have, haven't got a clue about, um, being free to just do something. And, um, I remember that the first, first class, nothing, 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 nothing happened or so it seemed. But the thing that was happening is that the handler had to learn how to let go of trying to control the learner in front of them. And, uh, so the dog got plenty of treats, even just for breathing, because there wasn't any anything happening yet. And I think we spent, uh, I think it was a third or the fourth lesson. So this was there was time in between lessons. I think two weeks in between classes, and the only homework they got was you're just going to sit down with your food. You're going to have I don't can't remember if it was a clicker or a marker word. I can't remember, but uh, and you're just going to mark. Every movement, so if it's a breath, if it's an ear movement, if it's an eye movement, if it's a tail, it doesn't matter, any movement. And then the fifth class rocked up, and then this little dog who'd been thinking about it, 12 years old, had been thinking about it. Nothing much had been happening at home, nothing much had been happening in classes, but the handler was letting go of control because they were just, you know, by the time we rocked up to the fifth class, they were like, well, we'll just see. They're breathing, they're moving their ears, doesn't really matter. And then all of a sudden, this little doggy sticks his nose into the bottom of a box and starts rolling the dice. Uh, And not just really tentative small movements, but they'd actually, I think, have been thinking about it and then developing this sense of, okay, I don't think it really matters what I do because there's reinforcement to be got. Um, so I'll just, you know, try something. And it was just brilliant to see that, um, out of 12 years of not having to have, not having to have any initiative or not wanting them to have any initiative, then all of a sudden, just by giving them time and by trying to relax the handler, um, they can actually switch their way of learning from being told to telling us what they want to do. So that was really cool. So those are my those are my top stories. They're fantastic stories, and I've written down a bunch of questions, but I'm also looking at the time. So we yeah. will <laughs> move on. Obviously, didn't disappoint with those yeah. great stories and lessons. Oh. Sadly, however, that does bring us to the final question for this episode. Sam, cool. could you please now take us all into the future and share with us what you would like to see happen over the next five to ten years in the dog proprioception and animal training world yeah for proprioception i would love it to be a part of every curriculum in every dog training it be it school course workshop whatever 
proprioception is a part of it. And it starts from puppy onward uh, to increase fitness in our adult dogs and senior dogs to get healthy, uh, to stay healthy whilst growing older. Uh, in dog training as a whole, I would love for um, people, for us as a whole, to learn more about the species that we live with from a young age. So I would love it to, you know, that we would learn more in schools. So so young people would learn in schools what it, what a dog is, what a cat is, what a horse is. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel of positive reinforcement again and again and again and again as soon as somebody leaves school and goes into training. Uh, so for me, that would that would uh, that would be fantastic if we can get these young people, uh, you know, basically with a clean slate. They they're young. They they don't know how it works, but they understand positive reinforcement because that is how we work. And if we could actually teach them then about the pets that we have or the animals that we live with, so uh, we won't have any animals have to deal with positive punishment anymore. Uh, in the name of training, um, yeah. So that would, for me, would be really, really important to do. Um, and choice and control are, are will have to be the only way we train. And that that for, that would be in ten years' time, we will know about communicating properly, and we will give the animals doesn't matter which species we work with choice, uh, and that way develop brilliant cooperation with whatever animal in whatever way we want it to be i'm excited to listen back to all these episodes in a decade yeah and, <laughs> that would be cool wouldn't it yeah and also to to see what we're saying in a decade yeah <laughs> how much we've changed yeah yeah i mean 10 years ago is still a big difference with now isn't it if you look at yeah. it yeah it's cool yeah hopefully i'm still doing this podcast in 10 years that Whoa. would also be amazing <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thank you so much for sharing everything today, Sam. Before we wrap up, I've said that three times now, but this will be the last. <laughs> <laughs> can you just share with everyone where they can go to find out more about you and pro perception and what you're up to? Yeah. Uh, depending on where you are, <laughs> the best way to find out about me is on Facebook. So uh, Sam Turner. If she's got red hair and smiling in the camera, that is the right uh, the right one to click and to add as a friend. My business page is Pause for Fun uh, One. It's, it's got a digit one uh, behind it. Um, and the new English website, samturner.nl, uh, will be up and running somewhere in the next five months. And that will give you more information on where my proprioception courses all over the world will be. And... Um, We'll also update uh, the Facebook and the website will then also update on how far I'm along with the books that I'm writing. So, uh, yeah, there will be books coming in English. The ones I've got now are only in Dutch, but I am working on that. Well, I'm excited that you're doing that because we've had numerous podcast guests from your corner of the globe and always yeah. trying to encourage them to share in English as well. I know yeah. it's a big ask. Yeah. But. Yeah, but we should be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so should not be a problem. Yep. Well, grateful for that. And we will link to all of the stuff in the podcast write up. So if you guys want to navigate there, if you wanted to find all of these links, uh, we will do that. Hey, so wonderful, Sam. So as we head towards the end, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time, not just today to come on the show, but corresponding with me over the last month or so, um, putting these ideas together and, and spending all of the time to, to share this information. Thank you. It's really appreciated. You're welcome. It's been a huge pleasure. I really enjoyed this, Ryan. Thank you. It's, it has been a lot of fun. And we, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. If you have enjoyed the episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation, with more behavior nerds about the most positive and less intrusive ways of influencing behavior. Then, as mentioned right at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to find out more how you can connect with like-minded positive reinforcement-based trainers from around the world. No matter what you're training, there is something there for absolutely everyone, whether it be forums, WhatsApp, private Facebook group, live web classes, and we're looking forward to having you join the family. 
That's it for this episode, though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again, everyone, so much for listening. For now, we'll head out, and you'll hear from us again soon. Mm-hmm.